We're very much sur la plage today for my latest vlog. I want to talk about the intensely enjoyable round table discussion I had on Radio Festival Cannes, the daily show presented by Jason Solomons with fellow panel members, the brilliant author, journalist and historian Agne Poirier and the festival director Claire Stewart. Now this is going up online as a podcast on the Cannes Film Festival website later on today. But as an exclusive preview, I'm giving you a 10 minute video clip, which I've taken myself, uh, and it's coming up here. So we'll stay with the panel. Peter, uh, what number can is this for you? 21. Oh, 21, 21. Oh, 21. Oh, 21, clear the door. Yes, yes, I mean, it doesn't seem like that, really. It doesn't seem like that, but yes, rather incredible. Has it changed over the years in terms of covering it as a journalist? Oh, it's changed a very great deal. I don't think the festival itself hasn't, I don't think has radically changed very much, but hey, there was a time when I came and I was like a rather leisured Edwardian gentleman wafting back and forth along the seafront, occasionally being required to write uh, little roundups. really. I had to do one or two individual reviews, but that was it. I could stay overnight in those analog dead tree days. Now I have to run out of the screening, I have to tweet, I have to put it on Instagram, I have to get my phone out and write the review so it goes up online as quick as possible. although the new embargoes for me incidentally have actually taken the heat off me a little bit. But yes, social media and the internet has... And has, vlogging? Has, uh, vlogging, I'm vlogging today, yes. Live Hello, vlogging. Oh, that's why I'm vlogging as well. So the social media and the digital world has, Im has enlarged and accelerated my work. Yeah, I'm amazed you're finding an hour to join us. I'm, I'm very too. Deep, deeply grateful for Not it. Not at all, my dear fellow. <laughs> um, flat out as ever. Well, Peter, what's your favourite personal can moment in all of that time? The, in all of that time, I, it's a real tricky one. I was uh, on the duty on certain regard jury a while ago, and that was uh, a sort of an amazing experience. I think we made some pretty iffy choices, I have to say. We look back, you know, we we, but we were under the very formidable directorship, chairpersonship of Emir Kusturica, who began his first, our uh, first jury meeting with me by getting that face. If you can imagine Emir Kusturica's face, really Funny. about eight inches from mine, and said, you gave my last film a bad review. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> anyway, my dear fellow, well, that wasn't me. Yes, it was you. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. But we got past it, and then he did that kind of, huh, just funning with you, just just messing with you, that kind of Don Corleone, just that breaking stuff your... stuff he's learned off gangsters. Yeah, just breaking your balls, Consiglione, <laughs> Paisana, breaking your balls. Forget it. Forget it. Did he have a massive cross full of cocaine yeah. during the jury meetings? <laughs> it certainly felt like it. Good. But no, 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 absolutely not. He was, he was given the Légion d'honneur that year in the midst of it all, which he kind of... We were sitting there and he passed this blue and whatever ribbon back and forth to all of us sorcerer-eyed jury members saying, look, look at this, the Légion d'honneur. That will annoy the liberals. <laughs> so we were all terrified of him. So well, he didn't have a film here as well. Did he have the Maradona film here that year? No, it was the year before, and that's yeah. the one he was talking about. Because yeah. I gave that one a bit of an iffy notice, and he, you know, he kind of didn't mind about it. <laughs> but it, we were all a bit. Which, which one was it? It was. The white kid? No, he he did a a kind of weird quasi documentary about his failure to make a documentary about Diego Maradona, where he failed to get an interview with him and all the rest of it. Asif Kapadia's version, rather more, I think, shrewdly, is just going on, going on archive, yeah, archive yeah, material, yeah, rather yeah. cleverly shaped in his deal. We talked about it yesterday. Yeah, yes, we gave but anyway, that's more or less it. I saw your review on the, if I make it, on the sports pages of the company. Oh, it was, was it? it? Yeah. I didn't even know that. So now you're a sports writer, I'm too. a sportsman as well. That's <laughs> amazing. Wow. Well, well, they're beginning to my talents, as Clive Anderson would say. Ah, it's gold. Agnès Parier, welcome, bienvenue, back back in Canada. But when you were... Uh, a young French woman or girl. What did Cannes mean to you as a as an event? Was it is it something that everyone in France knows about? Oh yes, and um, it's it's like the Olympic uh, Games, you know, of cinema, uh, and across also in the Nobel Prize of cinema. Um, but you know, it be, I mean, it's it's as important to us as it is to the world of cinema. Let's say. Uh, I started going here as a cinephile as a student. So yeah, I had to beg for invitations. You know, it's it's an it like rite of passage. A rite of passage. You, you let go down. If you're a Parisian cinephile, well, you have to do this. You know, from the age of seventy, um, and then gradually I got uh, uh, an accreditation, and uh, so I've been coming for almost twenty years, um, and it has changed massively. Yes, but I wouldn't be as positive <laughs> as Peter, um, in the sense that films are always 
fantastic. But it's so difficult now to go and see them and the whole trial now of security and uh, the PR going bad. And uh, um, I, I still, I'm old enough to remember having one to one interviews because, uh, you know, being French, I wouldn't have anything else but one to one interviews. And I managed. Um, from pretty early age to you know, be alone in two hours uh, with Shamal or with uh, Clint Eastwood. It doesn't happen anymore. And once, I, I think I did uh, uh, two round tables, you know, when you are, I discovered that world I didn't know. Uh, yeah, that's, that's um, exactly what you're saying. 35 festivals. different uh, um, film critics or film journalists, 35 different nationalities. One talent, a talent as we call them, I mean we don't call them film director or actor, no, they are a talent. Um, and they are as bored, you know, as we are. And one journalist actually works for a um, home interior magazine and asks about, yeah, I don't know, their favourite colour. Yeah, or when, are you come, when are you coming to Tromso? Mm. And it is awful for everyone included, you know, included uh, around Although the Although that's not, they're not officially sanctioned by the festival, those things, those things are extraneous, they can do that, the, 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 the festival seems to say, well, it's just about the films, we put them well, on. Well, and it should be all about the films, and that's why we keep coming back, because in the end, you get to see the best prop of the year, but there's so much, you know, sort of parasite um, uh, life around it, which makes it... Slightly less pleasant. And do you cover it still for Le Monde? Do you... Not for Le Monde. It depends on, on the stories, what I see and what I feel like, you know, uh, writing. And uh, so I'm, I'm fortunate that way. I don't have to produce. I um, need to react. Yeah, brilliant. Well, thank you for reacting to us. Well, all of that time in 20 years. Even well, that, more. There are too many. I can give you two uh, uh, lovely uh, uh, souvenirs. One is to go very early, about 7, 7.30 a.m. because I was, uh, my hotel was quite far away, so I would have to walk for an hour down the closet. And seeing Jack Nicholson in his tuxedo, not looking, I mean, still, you know, walking alone without any bodyguards, more than being, you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago. And, uh, and it was such, you know, quite, uh, very few people, just me and him crossing paths. Um, that's, that's one. Did you say good morning? Sorry? Did you say good morning? No, and at all you have to cherish those, you know, silent moments. Um, another one was pretty funny. I was passing and you, you know about shoes shops in Canada. I mean, it's, it's, you know, boutique you've never encountered in your life before and you will never see anywhere else in the world. Very expensive, ridiculous, uh, sort of, you know, a lot of diamonds on every single pair of shoes. And I saw Arnold Schwarzenegger putting on or, or trying on, I don't know whether in the end he, he bought them, crocodile, I think they were electric blue crocodile leather boots. And I had to stop in my track and I just looked at it and then I, you know, went on. I, I like to think that he tried them on, said, I'm not going to think about them, he said, I'll be back. <laughs> And, and then bought them. You don't have my size. <laughs> <laughs> uh, beautiful, I guess. Bye, merci beaucoup. Claire Stewart, uh, former, as I said, uh, artistic head, head, artistic director of the London Film Festival, curator in chief, head of the London Film Festival. Uh, it's been, a, been a couple, this is your second year not being that. Uh, what, did, what did Cannes mean to you when you were an FF uh, Suprema? What did, it, what did you get from Cannes? Well, Cannes was a very different beast for me in the context of programming a festival because you are really doing every element of the festival experience from seeing as many films as possible and then uh, you know in these 45 minute windows between screenings you're racing off to meet with a sales agent you're in the middle of negotiations on trying to get someone on your jury or to get somebody uh, to represent a film at uh, your upcoming festival so in fact the pace for me now is like a return a beautiful return to cinephilia because I'm actually just here to luxuriate in the films themselves. Um, and interestingly, my first can, uh, which was 2006, so a little bit more recent, um, that was uh, the year that I had, I had just found out I was about to be the director of the Sydney Film Festival, mm -hmm. but it was a secret. So can you imagine being in Cannes and I know that I'm about to become the director of the Sydney Film Festival at that point, and I can't tell anybody. But you, like, can't, even, you can't even go up to them and say, hey, do you want to be on my festival, Joe? No, I couldn't, I couldn't, because, you, you know, the, the, yeah. the, ne the, the next edition of the festival was about to happen with the previous director and so forth, so yeah, it was all 
um, all the secrets. So, but it was quite a wonderful way to do my first can because I was I almost hovered over it with this this kind of um, view of what it was going to become for me, and um, and that was quite an exciting way to do it. When, when you're a critic, you sort of see a film and you think, ah, oh, that's that's my favourite, that's my good car, I'm falling in love, and I've got a film to talk about. And yes, you might say, well, that's the one I'm going to write about. And Peter, you might go, oh, that's my five star. I'm going to kind of put a lot of you know put a money on it. When you see, saw a film as curator of the LFA. Would you kind of go, right, that's my centrepiece gala, I've seen, I know what I'm going to do with it, I'm going to open the best it's with it. Very rarely would you do that, and, um, and not here, because uh, obviously we're, uh, where, where it was in, in terms of the calendar of preparing the program, there were many, many more films that you would see between Cannes and blocking the London Film Festival and, program. And the, and the narrative would change because London was is in October, so you've got the Oscar, the Oscar Correct. bounce at the beginning. And also I made a very big push on, I wanted to have um, European premieres and world premieres in big positions. So we would definitely invite a lot of films directly out of Cannes, and that still happens under Trisha Tuttle's new leadership, I'm sure. Um, but the sort of positioning discussions would happen further down the track. How does it work? I'm always intrigued, because you sort of see, let's say you see, you, you know... You can ask me now, because I don't yeah, need to be yeah, exactly. So you see a film, and you think, great, you, you go up to the sales agent and say, look, don't show it, don't sell it, we, we want to keep it, keep it until October. So that's part of your strategy, because, you know, you see it at Cannes, and then it's something that's in London, and you think, well, how have they kept it quiet for six months? Where's mm -hmm. it been? Mm -hmm. No, well, it's a combination, of course, because the sales agent's primary objective here is also to sell the film to a UK distributor, if that's not already in their um, in their uh, deal, and uh, so one of the things I would do is ring uh, a, a sales agent the minute I've seen a film that I know we will want, and say we're going to invite it. If that helps you um, to uh, pitch to a distributor, please use that information. You know, so I I I would not kind of be all you you must keep it secret because obviously for uh, anybody who is a lover of film, the thing you most want is for as many films as possible to be released in the country, right? So so it, it is kind of like that kind of advocacy. And then yes, there's there's a lot of um, a lot of very well kept secrets for a very long yeah, there are. period. Well, I love the horse trading that goes on with the behind the scenes. You don't always know this as a, as a film critic. Uh, Claire, as a So there it is, that's it for the day. Please do the right thing and subscribe to this channel.